Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, so first of all, congratulations, you've made it to the last day of reInvent. Um, but actually, I think more impressively, you've made it into this room at 9 a.m. this morning after last night. So thank you very much for coming. Um, so it's Magento we're here to talk about today, um, and in particular, how to run and scale Magento on the AWS platform. Uh, my name's Sean Pierce. I'm a solutions architect for AWS based out of the UK. Um, and I'm also pleased to say we're joined by one of our partners, Illustera. Uh, so Zach will be up a little bit later on talking about how to actually run Magento on AWS. Uh, they run a managed platform for their customers, so can give us some good insight into that. So what's the, what's the goal of today? Um, so as I was putting this together, it, it became pretty simple. So I've previously managed operational teams that have looked after e-commerce platforms and other web properties. Um, and I know how painful it is when these things don't work, when they don't scale, when they're not highly available. You're up at night putting in fixes, you're uh, waking up at 2 a.m. to kind of restart servers and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it's, it's not a very nice place to be. So the goal of today really is just to allow you to go away with some practical tips and techniques that you can hopefully implement on your platforms um, and really just make running Magento boring, right? This is, this is the ultimate goal. We don't want it to be exciting. We want it to be a very boring thing. Um, just a quick show of hands. So who's actually using Magento on AWS at the moment? Okay, good, a few of you. So keep your hands up if you never have any operational issues. It scales beautifully, it works. Yeah, one. <laughs> That's cheating. <yeah. laughs> okay, so before we, um, before we get too much into the technology, I just wanted to start off by just sort of taking a step back, have a quick look at online retail and why speed is, is so important in the industry. So this, these um, numbers were taken from a recent industry survey that looked at the um, the relationship between page load times and consumer behavior on e-commerce sites. And it found that 40% of users would actually um, abandon a page if it takes more than three seconds to load. Um, and on top of that, nearly 80% of users would actually, if they're dissatisfied with site performance, may never come back again. So these two things combined, it means that if we have these kind of temporary performance issues on our sites, um, not only are we affecting sales that are happening now, but potentially kind of future sales as well. So very important we get this right. And of course, retail is a very seasonal business. So this is a typical traffic profile for Amazon.com in November. Um, you can see us really ramping up towards the end of, um, end of November as we get into peak season. Um, and actually, another industry survey found that um, industry-wide, sort of year-on-year e-commerce sales over the holiday period in 2013 were up about 12%. So kind of annual growth we come to expect in the industry. But actually, there was a huge 54% increase in what they called last-minute sh uh, shopping orders. And what they mean by sort of last minute orders are users coming in on the last possible day they can to make a purchase before delivery at Christmas. And so for me, that means as we, as we get better at the logistics that sit behind these e-commerce stores, user gonna, users are going to leave it to the last minute more and more. They're going to be more and more confident in leaving those orders to the last minute. So we're going to continue to see this kind of compounded growth going forward. And then the final point is the holiday season, we get a lot of notice for that, right? But what about the... Um, the email campaigns, the TV ads, all the other things that happen where we get very little notice, or often very little notice, but obviously our sites, are still, our sites still need to, to perform. So how do we address this with Magento? Um, well, let's, let's start off by looking at some of the challenges. So it's, it's safe to say that plenty of people struggle with Magento out there. Right? There's, you quick Google search, you'll find thousands of articles on 101 reasons my Magento site is slow, seven ways to speed up my Magento site. But for me, it's, it's really important that we sort of understand the underlying characteristics of the application. Why do people struggle so that we can develop an architecture that, that addresses those and kind of mitigates those risks? So a couple of things that jump out at me. So the first thing we need to be aware of is this EAV data model. So the data model that makes Magento so flexible and why most of us use it um, also can really cause some performance issues. Um, Magento isn't a cloud-native application, right? It requires things like shared storage, and these can be challenging in a, a dynamic cloud environment. And then lastly, we see a lot of customers that are you know, making use of the, the great community out there. There's lots of extensions out there that you can purchase or open source ones that you can download. Quite quickly add functionality to your Magento site, but you really need to be aware of what you're installing and what impact that potentially can have on performance. So what process should we follow then to take Magento and make sure that it, it meets our requirements? 
Um, so for me, what we need to do is start with a, a stable base. So let's get something that's highly available, very stable, and use that as a foundation. And then we can look at that architecture. We can start to say, well, where's the bottlenecks likely to be? And we can iterate on that architecture. We can um, improve it. We can remove that bottleneck. And that, of course, will expose another bottleneck somewhere else. And we can carry on with that iterative process. And that's going to leave us with a, a platform that's highly available, but also very stable and can really scale to meet our needs. So what does that highly available base, that foundation, look like? So this is what I'm kind of terming our, our minimal viable product for a Magento production implementation. Um, and we just spend some time just stepping through this. So the first thing you'll see, so we've deployed Magento onto multiple EC2 instances. Um, those instances sit in separate availability zones. And then we've got an elastic load balancer at the top there, which is distributing requests to those instances. So that, that's automatically much more available, much more stable than just a single instance. Um, we can use health checks on the load balancer to detect any kind of hardware or software failure on those instances and automatically um, only send requests to the healthy ones. Um, and actually here we've gone one step further. So we've wrapped those instances at the top there in an auto-scaling group. Uh, and this gives us a self-healing nature to the platform. So now if we have a hardware failure, a software failure, auto-scaling can kick in, it can detect that failure, terminate the instance, throw it away, provision a new one and put that into service. So that's another thing, we're not getting out of bed at 2 a.m. to kind of fix and, and do ourselves. Now, there's some work there that you're going to need to do. So you need to think about how you're going to bootstrap those Magento instances. So do you take the operating system, all of your Magento code, all of your configuration, and bake that into an AMI? Uh, or do you use software configuration management tools like Chef or Puppet? Uh, and that's something that Zach's going to talk a little bit later on about how they kind of solve those, those operational issues. Um, of course, when you're running multiple instances, you need to think about things like sessions. So if you just go through the default Magento implementation, you'll be storing your sessions in its file store, so on the local instance. Um, and that's, that's not going to work in a multi-instance auto-scaling environment. So what we'd probably advise at this point is to push those sessions down to the database. So natively supported by Magento, you just need to configure it at installation time. And then that leaves you with all of your instances being able to serve any request to any user at any time. So much more flexible. Um, the database itself, so you'll notice we're, we're using RDS. So we've got MySQL 5.6 running in RDS. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about kind of operational benefits of RDS. There's, there's been talks on that. But you will notice that we're deployed in a highly available manner. So RDS is going to worry about deploying instances in multiple availability zones. It's going to worry about the synchronization between the instances, and it's going to worry about a failover and how that would take place if needed. Um, at this point, it's probably also worth noting, so when we were developing this architecture, it was tested, and we created it with uh, 5.6. Um, obviously, we've got Aurora now. Um, so I'm very keen to start you know, testing that with Magento as well. Given the 5.6 compatibility, you know, I think we're going to see some, some great improvements there as well. But something you need to test sort of as you get access on your platforms. Um, and then finally, shared storage. So you see here that we're running NFS on EC2. Um, I'm not, again, going to go into a huge detail about running highly available NFS stores. Um, one, it's, it's a talk in itself. Um, but also, as we look to evolve this architecture, so as we go through this presentation, we're going to look at alternatives to NFS and how we can hopefully remove it completely. If you are interested, then um, there was a great talk by one of my colleagues last year at reInvent 2013, so NFS is SIFS options for AWS. It's available on YouTube, so do check that out. It goes through um, how to run your own NFS services as well as having a look at the, van, uh, the vendor landscape out there as well. OK, so back to our architecture. So we've got that high availability now. We can deal with hardware failure. We can recover. Um, we've got a solid platform. So we're going to see more traffic. Hopefully, we've got a popular e-commerce site. Um, as that evolves, we're going to see our first bottleneck. Um, and where that is will depend on your application. It depends on your code. It depends on how your users are going to interact with your store. But actually, more than likely with Magento, it's going to be a CPU constraint in Magento itself. So how do we solve this one? Well, actually, this, this one is easy. right? So we've actually already done all the hard work. So we've moved our sessions down to our database. We've got a shared storage platform to allow sharing things like slash media. Um, and we've already done the auto scaling. So we've got some bootstrapping in place. We can bring instances into service. So actually, we just turn up the dial. So turn up auto scaling. Let's bring new instances in. Um, they can join the fleet, and they can start taking some load. 
And actually, we can go one step further, so we can have scaling policies in place as well, and that will allow us to automatically bring instances in and out um, according to CP utilization. So again, not something we're having to do manually. Now, when you've got those multiple instances, of course, you're going to be sending more and more requests down to the database. Um, and at some point, that's then going to manifest itself as a bottleneck as well. So how do we solve this one? So a great opportunity to bring in a centralized back-end cache for Magento. Um, and actually, the, so the latest versions of Magento have native support for Redis built in now. Um, and I think Redis has some great advantages over alternative technologies like Memcached in this particular use case. So Redis allows you to group similar cache items together, so something known as tagging. Um, and then that gives Magento the ability to have much more control over how it purges the cache and therefore makes that cache a lot more efficient. Um, you can run Redis on EC2, but here we're using ElastiCache, so our own service to really remove some of that operational complexity. Um, and in particular here, we're using one of the latest features, which is a multi-AZ Redis deployment. So you'll see we're running, or ElastiCache has actually deployed a master Redis node in one availability zone. Um, it then deploys multiple read slaves into separate availability zones. Um, and it really monitors the health of that node. If there's an issue with the node itself, with connectivity to that node, it can initiate a failover. So it promotes the slave. It will actually reprovision a new slave to replace it. Um, and then it will do all the DNS rewiring needed. So we don't need to touch our application, but we get that data durability and that high availability as well. Um, once you've got Redis in place, uh, you can also move the sessions. So although we needed those to be in the database right at the start, latest versions of Magento also have native support for sessions in Redis as well. So let's take them out of that relational data store and let's put them into an in-memory data store where we get better performance and we kind of alleviate some of that database load as well. Um, so for moderately sized Magento sites, you, you'll probably decide to run a single ElastiCache cluster, and you can put your sessions and your cache in there. Um, you can configure it in your local .xml file like this. Um, one thing to be aware of, so use separate database identifiers for your cache and for your sessions. This gives you a bit of isolation within the Redis instance. It allows you to tear down sessions without affecting cache or vice versa. So much better isolation of those two use cases there. Um, as you look to grow Magento, so you're serving more and more traffic, you might decide to run separate independent ElastiCache clusters for things like sessions, back-end cache, and if you're running enterprise Magento, then the, the full-page cache as well. So this gives you the obvious benefit of being able to scale out the amount of addressable memory for your Redis tier. Um, you can still run separate masters and slaves in different availability zones for that durability. Um, but it also gives the ability to further isolate your, your different use cases. So now you can tune the way you're using ElastiCache. You can run different node sizes for different use cases, um, get faster or slower CPUs for different use cases. So, so really tune the way you're using it. OK, so we're back to the architecture. So we've got that caching in place now. Um, but what about those operational scenarios where we need to clear cache? Um, we all try and avoid it. We don't want to do sort of mass evictions of cache, but there may be big breaking deployments. There may be um, big different changes to your data structure that require you to essentially clear out the whole cache or, or the majority of it. So when that happens, you've got a cold cache. You get a stampede down to the database. All those requests that were hitting cache are now hitting your database. And again, you're going to see this become a, a bottleneck within those times. And we really need an architecture that allows us to do that. We don't want to be scared of clearing cache. We need to be able to kind of survive those kind of operational scenarios. So one way of solving this is to introduce read replicas. Um, so RDS provides uh, sort of one-click deployment of read replicas into multiple availability zones. Um, and Magento can support read replicas just by kind of adding the endpoints into your local .xml file. Uh, one thing to be aware of, so if you're running custom extensions, do be aware of how they're going to deal with read replicas. So do they honor the read replicas? Do they, how do they deal with the asynchronous replication lag that you, you're going to see, even if it's just you know, a few seconds or less than that? Um, again, with Aurora, we're going to see significantly reduced replication lag with read replicas. So I think that's something that's really going to help, but definitely something that needs to be tested. So at this point, we can scale out our front end further. So you see we've added more front end instances. We've got a data tier that now can, can serve more content. So we can run more Magento instances and serve more, more pages to the end users. Now, the thing to remember here is that for every page we're now serving, we're potentially also going to be serving three, four, five multiple images. And all of those images are coming from that NFS server. 
So again, at some point, NFS is going to come that bottleneck. Now, you can scale up NFS. You can run a faster EC2 instance with more network bandwidth. You can have provisioned IOPS on the EBS volumes. Lots of things you can do there. But actually, at this point, I would consider using Amazon S3 to start to serve some of that content. So S3 has been designed for near linear scalability. So it's a great platform not just to store the content, but also to serve static web content directly to end users. Now, once you've got that working, you can also introduce CloudFront. So CloudFront is our content distribution network. Um, and that has, so 52 geographical pops around the world. And this allows you to start store, uh, caching and serving that content from locations very close to end users. So again, that's going to lower the latency of those requests. And much quicker image loads really kind of increases the perceived performance of pages. It feels much snappier and more performant to users. Now, there are lots of extensions out there that help you to do this. So free extensions you can download that give you that integration. But a couple of things to be aware of. So the, the first thing is, is that they don't actually remove the need for shared storage altogether. So many of them will require some shared storage for your admin instance that you see in the bottom left-hand side there to be able to share original images to the front-end instances that will then do a resize and upload to S3 on first request. So it kind of removes some of the, it removes NFS from that critical path, but it doesn't remove it altogether. Um, and that's one of the reasons, so I work with a number of customers at the moment that are developing their own extensions that can completely remove NFS from, from the architecture altogether. The way they do that, they follow a, a similar set of steps, and we're, we're step through those now. So the first thing that's going to happen is an admin user uploads an image to our admin instance, so a new, new image for a new product. What we want our extension to do is use our APIs to directly push that to S3, so no more, no more putting it on disk. Now, at some point, we're going to get our first request for that image, um, and that means that the front-end instance needs to go to the database and check whether that image is yet to be resized. If it hasn't been resized, it goes to S3, it retrieves the image, it can do the resizing, and then pushes those resized images back up to S3. And then finally, it stores that in the database, so it records the fact that the resize has happened. And now the next time an image, uh, a request for a page comes through with those images, we check in the database, we see the images resized, and we serve the page up directly with those S3 URLs. So we're removing that need for NFS for, for media storage and serving. So a couple of things to take note. So the, the first one is when you're pushing content to S3 to actually serve directly, make sure you're setting appropriate cache control headers. So this is going to instruct the user's browser and the CDN, so CloudFront itself, to actually cache those images appropriately and in increase the cache efficiency. The other thing is you're going to need to serve these images over both HTTP but also HTTPS for secure areas of the site. So if you're happy with serving under CloudFront's own domain, then you can use CloudFront's SSL certificates, just start calling over HTTPS, and, and we'll serve. If you want to use your own domain, so let's say you know, images.mysite.com or something like that, then you need to upload your own SSL certificates to CloudFront, but again, something that, that's supported. Um, and then the last three points, so when configuring CloudFront, just make sure you don't pass through headers, cookies, or query strings back to S3. So this is static content. There's no need to dilute our cache by including those kind of things in the requests. And again, by doing that, we're more likely to serve from CloudFront and therefore increase the latency. OK, so back to our architecture. So we've removed NFS now. We've removed that bottleneck. And this gives us the ability to continue to scale up those Magento instances. So more instances, load balance, serving more and more requests. Now, again, what you'll find is that as you do that, each one of those images will be serving repetitive content. So the same pages, the same product pages, the same catalog pages each and every time. So actually, to make this more efficient, why not add a cache in front of those Magento instances as well? Um, and here you'll see we're using Varnish. So Varnish is a great HTTP accelerator. Um, and the reason we select Varnish is it has such great support within the Magento community itself. So there are already extensions out there that help you to extend Magento to actually use Varnish. So it allows Magento to set appropriate cache control headers to tell Varnish what to cache and for how long for. Um, and it also allows Magento to purge the Varnish cache. So if certain events happen, like a change in stock control, we need to reflect that on the site as quickly as possible. And so Varnish, uh, Magento can actually purge explicit pieces of the Varnish cache very quickly. Um, on top of that, you also 
you, you also are going to have even greater um, support for Varnish within Magento 2. So looking at that product going forward, it's going to have inbuilt support for Varnish. You can actually produce VCL configurations straight from Magento. So it's, it's the right accelerator for this particular use case. Now, I'm not going to talk too much more about the integration with Magento and Varnish. I think do check out those extensions um, and test them with your sites, make sure they work. But what I do want to do is talk a little bit about how to successfully run a Varnish cache on AWS. Uh, and to do that, there's a few things you need to know about our, how our elastic load balancing service works and also about how Varnish has been designed and how it operates. So what we see here is um, a request coming into our platform. So if we see that we've got the, our customer, the end user on the left-hand side there, they're going to send a request into our platform. And the first thing that's going to do is hit an, an external elastic load balancer. Uh, that load balancer will then distribute requests to multiple Varnish nodes that's doing the caching. In this diagram, we're just seeing one. And then from there, if the cache is cold or the, the cache item isn't there, Varnish is going to have to go and then request that from Magento. And you can see here it's going via an internal elastic load balancer, so a second load balancing tier. And that load balancer will then be responsible for distributing requests to, to Magento. Now, when you create a load balancer, an elastic load balancer, you'll be given a DNS name. And it's that DNS name that we expect clients to send requests to. But we expect a client to, to first of all, resolve that DNS name. And if there are multiple IP addresses that are returned, then we expect the client to deliver round-robin load balancing to those different IP addresses. Um, and we also expect the client to obey the TTL. So if we're saying to re-resolve every 60 seconds, we need that client to re-resolve every 60 seconds and take into account any changes in that IP address space. And what this allows us to do is essentially scale the load balancing service on your behalf, depending on how much load we're seeing. Now, Varnish, on the other hand, has been designed for speed. So what it will actually do is you'll give it a DNS name in the, uh, the VCL configuration. And when you start Varnish, it will resolve that DNS name. But it will take the first IP address, and it will continue to just use that IP address for the, the lifetime of that process running or until the configuration is reloaded. And this creates an issue like we see here. So what we end up doing is sending all of our requests back to a single IP address to that elastic load balancer. So that's going to cause a few issues. So we're no longer spreading our load across all of the underlying infrastructure that's running our load balancer. Um, if we scale up in response to additional load from you, you're not going to be using those additional IP addresses. And actually, the worst one, we might actually be sending traffic to an IP address that's no longer associated with our load balancer. So those requests are just going to be dropped, and we're not going to see the responses. So how do we solve this one? So a lot of customers will decide to remove that second layer of load balancing. So instead of having that internal load balancer, why don't we use Varnish to just load balance to those instances? So Varnish can load balance. We can take the IP addresses from each one of our backend Magento instances, put them in the VCL, start, start up, and we'll get load balancing. And that, that will work. But we need to think about the fact that we're in a dynamic environment. So those Magento instances are sitting in an auto-scaling group. They can come and go at any time. So how do we deal with that? So again, many customers will write scripts to deal with this. So write the script, put it on a cron every minute, wake up, have a look at the environment. What IP addresses are out there? What's running? Is this different from my VCL? If it is, rewrite the VCL, reload the config, go to sleep, wake up in a minute, and do it all over again. It will work, but you can see there's lots of moving parts there. There's, lots of, there's code you need to write. There's code you need to support in a production environment. So one alternative is to use Nginx for your DNS resolution. So in this configuration, you continue to use Varnish to do all of the, the good caching and the integration into Magento that's already there. But when Varnish needs to send a request back to the application tier, sends it back to a Magento process, uh, sorry, an Nginx process running on the same EC2 instance, so localhost 8080. Nginx, on the other hand, is, is, can do this DNS resolution as we expect. So it can re-resolve re the IP addresses according to the TTL. It can round-robin load balances to the IP addresses it gets back. So that will work, and it removes the need for any of that additional code that you need to write. Now, if you're going to set this up, there's a couple of kind of pointers you're going to need to look out for. So the first thing, you need to tell Nginx where to resolve DNS. Um, it doesn't listen to the operating system. It won't just do it on your behalf. Um, so you can see here what we've done is we've passed the IP address of the DNS server to the resolver within the Nginx config. 
Now, if you're running in a virtual private cloud, we will provide a DNS server for you on your behalf. And it's always located at the base of the IP range of your VPC, plus two. So if you create a VPC which has an IP range of 10.000 slash 16, then the IP address, will, uh, sorry, the DNS server will always be at 10.0.0.2. And then the other one that sort of I picked up in testing was all current versions of Nginx don't actually um, or can't re-resolve DNS if you pass that DNS string straight to the proxy pass, which is the piece of configuration in Nginx where it needs to go. Um, if you do that, it will resolve once on startup and not re-resolve. And again, you won't pick up on those changes in the IP addresses. So what you need to do is just take the DNS name, pass it to a variable, and then pass that variable into the proxy pass. That may be something that's addressed in future versions of Nginx, but as it stands now, you need to just make sure you're doing that as well. OK, so we've talked a lot about um, resolution and getting Nginx up and running. Um, as we add more layers into our architecture, it's also worth thinking about a health checking strategy. Um, so many customers will tend to do what we call deep health checks. Um, and by deep health checks, I mean every layer of the application actually reaching right back into the application layer to Magento itself to check whether Magento is up and it's healthy. Um, and this can cause something that we call a shared fate scenario. And I'll talk through what that means. So we've got our um, health checks on Magento. So some PHP file that's running within Magento that's, that's telling our internal load balancer that we're, we're up and running, we're healthy. Um, Varnish is doing the same. So Varnish is actually reaching back through and checking that same file to make sure that everything is healthy. So everything's up and running. But let's say we make a deployment, and it's, it's a bad deployment. We didn't test it for some reason. It's gone through, and it stops Magento from being able to respond. So all of a sudden, Magento can't respond to any health checks. And what that means is our internal elastic load balancer is going to see that issue, and it will start to take those, those instances out of service as it detects that they're unhealthy. But the problem is, in addition to that, is that Varnish will then not be able to respond to its health checks from its load balancer. And before you know it, you'll also have those instances out of service as well. And this is kind of the worst case scenario, right? So we've made a bad deployment, and now we've got no healthy instances. We're not serving any content, and our, our store's down. And actually, the worst thing is, is that Varnish probably had a, a whole load of popular pages cached and ready to serve, but they've now been torn down because the, the instances were unhealthy. So alternatively, what you want to do is just keep those health checks on the back end so, and continue to have the internal load balancer checking those instances, making sure they're healthy. But run a completely separate and independent health check for your varnish layer. And actually, if we've got the, the architecture that we've got here, you really want to serve that health check out of Nginx. And then you know that your external outside load balancer is checking the health of the varnish process and the Nginx process. Now in the same scenario, Magento goes down, we've made a bad deployment, but our varnish instances will all stay up, they'll stay healthy, they'll continue to serve product pages, home pages, and everything else like that. OK, so back to the architecture. There's a few other things we need to do here before we're complete. And the first one is, is tuning of the cache. So the goal really should be that varnish is serving the vast majority of all of our pages. So anything that's cacheable comes from varnish. And actually, that ends up with only a very small number of requests coming back to the Magento instances themselves. So the Magento instances are there to process orders, to serve out checkout workflows, and maybe some personalized content. And actually, at that point, what we can do is scale in the architecture. So we no longer need to run these um, heavy compute instances running Magento. We can bring those in, and we can actually lower the cost of, of ownership of the platform. OK, so that's all I wanted to cover from an architecture point of view. Um, thanks for listening. I know that, um, or we all know, really, that, that designing a scalable architecture is only really half the issue. It's only solving half the problem. What we also need to do is have the operational tools and the processes in place to run it. So for that, I'm going to hand over to Zach. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. So yes. I'm Zach. Uh, I'm co-founder and chief architect at Elastera. Uh, we provide a fully managed platform for Magento. Uh, we've been running for around about a year and a half, but our story starts a little over 10 years ago when I worked with my co-founder, Osvaldo, at a company called Vendor. Uh, Vendor were early pioneers of software as a service e-commerce. 
Uh, we found that retailers loved a lot of things about software as a service. Um, they loved that they didn't have any headaches and they could focus on running their business. So to steal a phrase from the keynote yesterday morning, um, uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting. Uh, the operations folks in the audience can probably grudgingly agree that in the retail world, most of operations is undifferentiated heavy lifting. Uh, if you mess up your performance, you'll probably lose some sales. Uh, if you mess up your availability, you're definitely going to lose some business. Uh, if you mess up your security, you might lose your whole business. But people aren't going to choose which shop to buy from just on the basis of how good their operations team is. Uh, so that's where we fit in. We wanted to allow uh, businesses to build on Magento, have control over their destiny, but not have to worry about these headaches. So we're building a platform. Um, that might seem like a little bit of a specialized niche kind of thing that you won't be able to relate to, but our objectives as a platform provider are probably uh, the same thing that most um, agencies, most individual uh, merchants are going to have as well. Uh, we need to be able to run Magento code as it comes to us from our client. Uh, if you've already got a Magento site on some other platform than AWS and you want to migrate it, you don't want to have to re-engineer the whole thing to move it across. Uh, we need to be able to manage many Magento sites, uh, but so do you, even if it's just dev and test environments alongside your production environment. Uh, and we need to be able to easily evolve our infrastructure. Uh, that can be as we learn new things and we want to roll that out across our customer base. It could be uh, as, the, as our customers grow and we need to step through this process that, uh, that Sean's described of identifying bottlenecks and growing out the architecture to support those. Our standard architecture will look somewhat familiar from earlier in this conversation. Uh, we, to call out a couple of differences, we don't use read replicas as a standard part of our architecture just because we do need to qualify those with a particular Magento site to make sure it performs correctly. Uh, we also use multiple CloudFront distributions. Uh, that way, the um, customer's browser can have more requests in parallel to get things like CSS and JavaScript and media and so on. Uh, now, even at a high level, uh, there's a lot of moving parts there in this architecture. Uh, we've got the basics, uh, the CloudFront, EC2, RDS, ELB. Uh, but there's a bunch of other resources that you need to be concerned about for security and operational uh, reasons, the VPCs, um, Elastic IPs, CloudWatch alarms, and so on and so forth. Um, we needed to have a way of managing all of these disparate pieces as a single whole. Uh, and that's where we started to use uh, AWS CloudFront. Um, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about CloudFront. Uh, if you are using it, there are a couple of fantastic sessions earlier this week, so you should check them out when they go up online. Uh, if you're not familiar with, uh, sorry, CloudFormation, not CloudFront. Uh, if you uh, are not familiar with it, it is a service from Amazon that allows you to describe a bunch of infrastructure as a JSON document. You feed it into a tool, and it will go and make everything for you. Uh, without any pointy clicky in the web interface required. Uh, when you want to make changes in the future, you update your JSON document, you feed it back into the tool, and again, it will go and do everything for you. When you're getting started out with CloudFormation, uh, the easy way to approach it is to have a single document. You open your word processor, your text editor, uh, and you fill things out until you've got all the resources that you need for your Magento site. Uh, if you're not currently using CloudFormation, that's a fine way to start. That's the way that I started. Um, don't let me discourage you from doing that. Uh, but it does have a problem. Um, if you want to make another site that looks exactly like the one that you've already built, that's fine. Not a problem. Uh, great for dev and test environments, for example. But if you want to evolve your site in some way, uh, you run into a problem. Now, say you wanted to add a second site. Uh, your first site is just for the US, and then you're going to have a second Magento site uh, to go international, and you want to be able to serve customers from a couple of different countries. They've each got their own domain names. They each need their own SSL certificates. You can't easily use two different SSL certificates on one ELB, so you're probably going to need to have a, a slightly different infrastructure with two ELBs and different certificates. Now, if you put everything into one template, uh, the problem here is that you're going to have to copy that template, change the one part of it, and now you've got two different templates to maintain. And if you want to change one of the common parts, uh, you're going to have to cut and paste that, uh, that change into both pieces. Uh, it's not really great from a maintenance perspective, and obviously, uh, while it's a small problem the first time you do it, over time it becomes a big issue. 
Uh, instead, structure your, uh, your cloud formation into a number of different templates dealing with different concerns of your site. And that way, if you do need to customize just one layer, you only need to have one variation of the templates. Everything else can be the same, and you can go about your merry way. The other thing that is worth mentioning about CloudFormation uh, and infrastructure as code, uh, which is a term I'm sure you've all heard over this week, uh, is the way that it promotes quality. Now, obviously, uh, code is not magically bug-free. You do have a, a process to go through to make sure that you don't have any issues there. But uh, coming from an operations background and having run books and things to make changes, uh, I do know the, the silly mistakes that you can make if you have to do maintenance out of hours and you're a bit tired and your coffee machine's broken and whatever. Um, so by putting everything into code, you can avoid a lot of these kind of issues. And one of the examples that we found was when we were starting to run more recent versions of Magento, uh, version, uh, the enterprise version 1.13 onwards and community 1.18 onwards, uh, is they started doing some more clever things with the, the database. They use triggers and views and so on. Uh, and by default, uh, RDS won't let you uh, create those uh, when you come from a random MySQL dump from another platform. So uh, we put these parameters into, uh, into RDS, uh, into CloudFormation. Uh, we had to do that the one time when we first discovered it, and then we never have to think about it again. It's not a problem that's ever come back. So by putting your fixes into your code, uh, you only need to learn these lessons once. Um, Auto-scaling is a really valuable uh, part of the AWS platform. Um, over time, uh, your load increases and decreases, and so you want to be able to spin up and tear down servers. But it's not always a, a, gradual, uh, a gradual change in load. Um, when somebody's sending out a newsletter, you can see a great spike, like two times or three times the number of customers hit your site in a period of just a couple of minutes. That's the example that we're showing here. Uh, and what you'll typically find if you're not using auto-scaling is that the CPU utilization across your cluster is going to fairly closely track the number of visitors or hits on the site. Nothing really uh, particularly surprising there. Now, if we take 80% um, utilization as a bit of a proxy for where the performance on your site might start to degrade, uh, this is a problem. Um, you send out the newsletter, and suddenly you've got a long period of degraded service. Just when you've spent a bunch of money to send customers to your site, they're having a bad time. Probably they're going to leave. So you need to consider how quickly can you actually scale when auto-scaling needs to kick in. Uh, in this diagram, uh, the green part is what we get when we start up our instance. Uh, the orange part is what we do as runtime configuration. So if you're building a basic operating system from uh, Amazon Linux or, or so forth and then adding everything at runtime, it can take you uh, some period of time to get everything up and running, perhaps 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, depending upon where you're setting your scale-up tr trigger, you might find that while auto-scaling helps you uh, minimize the amount of unhappy customers, it doesn't uh, remove that, uh, that consideration entirely. You can improve this situation a little bit by starting to bake some more of the software into your AMI. So build a custom AMI with uh, you know, your web server, PHP, any other tooling that you need. Uh, in this way, uh, we might find that it takes only five minutes to start up a new site. And so uh, we further reduce the period of unhappiness that, uh, that customers are going to have when they come to the site. Can we do better than this? Well, there's a couple of options. Um, one of them is to lower our scale-up trigger. Uh, and if you've got to deal with unpredictable spikes in load that, uh, and you'd prefer to manage performance at the, uh, the cost of increased cost, that can be a good thing to do. But newsletters and other marketing activities are usually planned. Somebody in your organization knows what's going to go, uh, what's going to be happening. Uh, they can talk to you ahead of time, and you can scale up proactively. And if you do this, you're effectively using all of your resources without causing any unhappiness to your customers. Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about deployment. Um, this is a section that I perhaps could have rewritten in light of uh, this week's announcements, but uh, if you're thinking about using the uh, deployment service, this will give you some thoughts about how you might want to go about implementing that for Magento. The first question that we ended up uh, having when we thought about our own deployment process is, should we bake the code in? If we bake in all the other software to uh, improve the amount of time it takes for us to scale up, can't we just bake in the whole Magento code? If you've just got one site, that might be a good option. Uh, obviously, it does mean that when you're deploying, you have to go through the whole process of baking an AMI, cycling your instances, and so on. We decided instead that we were just going to build a AMI that knew how to retrieve its code at startup. Uh, what we did, uh, in the same way that the deploy service works, is to decide that putting the code onto an S3 bucket was the way to go. So our deployment architecture looks something like this. Uh, 
We have a deployment server that coordinates our uh, deploy activities. We have an S3 bucket, which keeps the, uh, the Magento code in it. Uh, and obviously, we have our various stacks of, of infrastructure. The first step in the deployment process is a developer triggering a deploy. Um, the deployment server could have had code pushed to it by the developer. It could retrieve it from a Git or Subversion repository. Uh, but one way or another, after it's triggered, it builds a package of code, and it uploads that into the deployment bucket. Now, you might be thinking, why don't we actually just push the code? If the deployment server's already got it there, uh, why, why bother going with the bucket in the first place? And there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is it's a little bit more efficient. Uh, this way, the deployment server only needs to push the bytes around once. Otherwise, the network bandwidth requirement for the deployment server would be vastly different if we had two Magento servers running or 200. Uh, by putting things through an S3 bucket, it's constant. Uh, the other issue is that we need to deal with auto-scaling. Um, having the deployment server push things when a, uh, to a bunch of Magento servers that are running is all fine, but uh, when other servers start up, they need to be able to get the code from somewhere. The next consideration is the deployment server needs to know uh, where the Magento servers are running. Uh, if you're based on a physical platform, you probably know exactly what the IP addresses of your Magento servers are because they don't change very often. Uh, that's not something you can rely upon uh, in AWS. There's a couple of ways that you can deal with this. Uh, the deployment service lets you uh, look at auto-scaling groups, or it lets you look at uh, tags on your EC2 instances. Those are both good ways to go. Uh, we use a system called uh, mCollective, which has a publish, subscribe, message queue kind of thing going on. Uh, so the deployment server can broadcast out a message saying, uh, what are the live Magento servers, and get a list back. So that's what it does. The first thing it does, it sends out a message to all of the Magento servers for the environment it's deploying to, saying, go ahead and prepare the, uh, the code. The Magento servers download that from the S3 bucket, and then they unpack it ready for use. Now, the code's not live at that point. It's just sitting alongside the code, which is live. That gives us an opportunity to deal with another problem, uh, which is Magento's upgrade scripts. Now, if you're familiar with uh, this process, Magento gives you a way of um, scripting updates to the site, things like schema migrations, adding attributes, and so on. Uh, the problem is that if you're running in a multi-server environment, particularly with a lot of load, uh, these scripts can run multiple times, because Magento, on every single hit, will look at whether there's any update scripts to run. So what we do to avoid this is the deployment server first sends a message to the admin server saying, go ahead and running, run any pending update scripts now. This happens before any customer requests are actually coming to the new code. After the update scripts have run, uh, we send another request, uh, another message across to all of the Magento servers to say, go ahead, switch over to the new code. Now, at this point, if you're using the uh, Magento's merging features for CSS and JavaScript, uh, new versions of those files are going to be created. Uh, this is because Magento uses the full path to the file uh, when it's constructing the hashed file name. Uh, so it's something to be aware of. If you're going down the road that, uh, that Sean has uh, talked about and that we use to push all of your media assets onto S3, you'll need to have some kind of mechanism of pushing these merged files up as well. More generally, you're going to want to be able to uh, either avoid purging objects from the CDN or, uh, or otherwise dealing with um, stale objects on the CDN. Uh, one way recommended by CloudFront is to put a version number uh, either in the file name or into the directory name. Um, this is something that uh, you can do in Magento by setting the base skin URL and the base JavaScript URL for each of your storefronts uh, to include the version number that you're deploying. When you go ahead uh, and you've got the new code running and serving requests from the customer, you then run some config updates to point out the new version of the directory. Uh, and at that point, you can flush the cache, and all of the URLs generated by Magento will use this new, uh, new variable. That way, you don't actually need to purge anything from the CDN, because everything's going to be a new object. So we do our reconfiguration, uh, and then we report back success to the uh, developer, and we're done. So I'm going to end with a little story that I thought was a little bit amusing uh, about a deployment that kind of went wrong, kind of went right. Uh, one thing that Magento does is it resizes all of your images for you on the fly. Uh, you just need to upload a full-size image, and it will figure out, based on your templates, what kind of size it, uh, it wants to be using. Um, one day, a customer pushed up a new deployment onto the site, and we noticed that the network bandwidth was higher than usual. Um, it's usual to see a, sp a spike in network bandwidth when you do a, a deployment. You clear the cache. There's a bunch more new objects to get out of the database and so on. 
Uh, but this is higher than usual, and the CPU load was up for a longer period of time than usual. Auto scaling kicked in and added a few more Magento servers. Uh, and we, we watched and we thought, well, let's see what happens here. Um, and a couple of minutes later, auto scaling kicked in again and it, it added a few more servers, and things were still pegged pretty, pretty close to the limit. And it turned out when we dug into this a little bit more that uh, our, uh, our customer had completely redesigned the site. They hadn't really worked with us to, to you know, get ready for that. Uh, and so suddenly they had 20,000 new resized images that they needed to, uh, to build. So, uh, you know, auto scaling kept on adding servers, adding servers. We went and added a bunch more. Uh, and in the space of half an hour or so, we'd finally caught up and all the new assets had been uh, created and pushed to S3. Uh, which is great, because if they were in a legacy environment, um, instead of, you know, adding 20 servers just to get these imagery sizes done, uh, literally the next two days would have been spent with terrible performance on that site uh, as it struggled to keep up. So even though Magento is not really designed to run in a cloud environment, I do think that AWS is a great platform for it. Uh, if you build things out the right way, it gives you all the tools that you need to uh, support the unpredictability of retail uh, and of Magento development. And now I will bring up Sean to close. Yeah, so thank you very much for coming. Um, I just encourage everyone to, to please do fill out evaluation forms. Um, and also, Zach and I will be out for questions just in the hallway. So please do come and grab us. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.